Hi guys and welcome to a new video. Today I'm going to go into all the where's and why's about graphite and graphite pencils. If you want to know more about the material you're working with or if you're a curious beginner who is just looking for information on the medium you chose, this video will help you out. Let's start with our art supply lesson. You might ask now, okay, what's there to know about a boring pencil? Well, when you know what the tool you work with is made of and where it comes from, you can assess much better how it's going to behave and what you need to pay attention to when handling it. It also helps with choosing a suitable surface to work on and possible additional helping tools. For our first chapter, I'll start with a little chemical analysis of the most important ingredient of a pencil, the mineral graphite. Graphite from ancient Greek graphene, which means to write, also known as black lead or plumbago, which again comes from the Latin word plumbum for lead. In history is carbon in pure form. The chemical sign is a C, it sublimates at 3750 degrees Celsius in an oxygen-free environment, starts to burn at 600 degrees when exposed to oxygen and is diamagnetic. Its crystal system is hexagonal and it has a Mohs scale hardness of 1 to about 3. That means you can scratch it with your fingernail and is also the reason why you get black fingers when you work with it. It occurs in metamorphic rocks and also in meteorites. Minerals associated with graphite include quartz, calcite, micas and tourmaline. In meteorites it occurs with troilite and silicate minerals. It is found in many places in this world. Biggest industrial producers are China, India, Brazil, Turkey and North Korea. It is also possible to make synthetic graphite. Graphite isn't only used for making pencils, but among other things, natural graphite is also used for refractories, batteries, steel making, brake linings, foundry facings and dry lubricants. Synthetic graphite is used for scientific research, electrodes, powder and scrap, as neutron moderator in nuclear plants, etc. In this place I also have a little hack for you in case you didn't know already. When you have problems getting a key into a lock, let's say for your front door, just stroke it with your pencil or dip it into graphite powder and it will slide into the lock without problems again. So, now that we know where our raw material comes from and what its properties are, let's have a look at the production process of an ordinary pencil. The lead consists of a burnt graphite clay mix. Mixing ratio goes from 20 to 90% graphite and is deciding about the later hard or softness of the pencil lead. This is also known as grades, which I'll explain in a later part of this video. The mixed ingredients are pressed through a nozzle and cut off. Then the lead is first dried at 160 degrees and then burned at 1100 degrees. I'm talking Celsius here. In Fahrenheit that will be 320 and 2012 degrees. After that it is enhanced with wax or palm oil to make it rub off smooth. The body of the pencil usually is made of wood, which came from cedar swans, but because this wood grows slow and is quite expensive, nowadays pencils are made out of pine, maple or lime wood. This wood is being cut then into the form of little boards into which a machine cuts screws for the leads to be inserted later. After that, the boards with the leads are glued to a second board, encasing the lead like a wooden sandwich. And 
Finally, the finished pencils are cut into shape. Most pencils have a hexagonal shape, so they don't roll off the table that easily. But, for example, stenographers' pencils are round, so that they don't press into their fingers that badly when they're writing for a longer time. Also, the perfectly centered placement of the lid is a sign for quality in a pencil. After the made in shape, pencils are painted with many types of varnishes, which nowadays are mostly water-based and so better for the environment. The hard or softness of a pencil is called a grade and depends on the mixing ratio of graphite and clay when the lead is made. The more graphite, the softer the lead. The more clay, the harder it will be. As far as I know, there's grades available from 9H, which is very hard, up to 9B, which is very soft. Though I've already seen artists working with a 10B pencil, so apparently they exist too somewhere. A regular HB pencil is medium hardness here in Europe, while in the US it is a grade harder and in Japan a grade softer. There's no standard for pencil hardness though the International Organization for Standardization once tried to establish one, but failed. <laughs> Grades are in my eyes a very important tool for an artist, as the use of different hard and softnesses of a pencil helps you to get the values in your artwork right. I personally work with HB and 8B most of the time. Also, sometimes I use an H or 2H for laying down a first layer of light skin tone or for pre-drawing. Later on, I will go in with softer grades then. Also, did you know that pencil leads are varying in thickness depending on their grade? A 9B, for example, is much thicker than a 9H. That has the simple reason that the 9B is softer because it contains more graphite and so would break easier if it were as thin as a 9H or HB. There are many different forms of pencils to find out there. From the classical ones that everyone knows from school, to carpenter pencils, mechanical ones or even big fancy painted wooden ones, and also ones that are made of plastic and that you can bend into a circle. But here I will only mention those that are important for us to work with. Number one would be the normal pencil. Not much to say about these here because we've already explained these. Then there are mechanical and clutch pencils. These are Basically the same, but with the difference that clutch pencils hold thicker lids. Mechanical and clutch pencils are more or less little tubes with a holding mechanism and a button on top to press, and made from metal or plastic, though I have already seen ones made of wood. They can hold leads of many different diameters, which go from 0.2 mm up to 5.6 mm. Mechanical pencils from 0.2 to 0.5 mm are great for making small details such as hair in portraits, small things like jewelry and much more. The only weakness here is due to the lead being pure and not covered in protective wood or something else, it breaks easily and you need to be careful with the pressure you apply. The next thing are graphite sticks. Basically, these are very thick mechanical pencil lids. They're covered in foil, paper or a layer of varnish and are available in many grades. They come as thin as a normal pencil but can also be bigger. They're not very good for doing small details but great for sketching and covering bigger areas. I personally also use them for making graphite powder by sharpening them. As for graphite powder, this is basically pencils in pulverized form. It can either be bought in stores or self-made. 
I think it also comes in different grades, but I can't say much about it because I never bought graphite powder. I only ever use the 9B one I made myself. And best tools to work with it are blending stumps, a cut bristle brush or q-tips. Now that we know how our tool is made and the shapes it comes in, let's have a look on where it actually comes from. Who discovered our beloved drawing tool? Pencil from old French pincel, which is the term for a small paintbrush, or Latin penicillus, which means little tail, is an artist's fine brush of camel hair which has also been used for writing before modern lead or chalk pencils. Interesting fact here is that paintbrushes are still called pinsel here in Germany. About 5000 years ago, the old Egyptians began to fill papyrus straws with pure lead and use them as writing tools. Lead poisoning included, I guess. <laughs> From the 13th century on, lead pens with a tip of silver were used for writing, but due to the hardness of the silver, the paper had to be laboriously prepared before it could be used for writing. However, some artists still use silver pens today, which contain no more lead, but a silver thread instead. The paper preparation stayed the same though. From 1558 on, graphite pencils were made in the North English town Keswick. The in 1564 discovered graphite in the nearby town Borrowdale had a great benefit on spreading the new writing tool. Since then, the wood-coated pencils started to take over the world. Still, the English manufacturers thought of graphite as lead ore. Hence the wrong name pencil lead or the German term Bleistift. In 1789, the German Swedish chemist Carl Wilhelm Scheele proved that graphite is not lead or but mineral carbon. He also gave it the name graphite. Because the pure graphite was used for military things such as melting pots for cannonballs. England partially imposed an export ban which pushed the procurement costs for a raw material. In 1790, the Vienna-based Josef Hartmut first mixed graphite powder with clay and water and burned it in an oven. Varying the portion of clay, he was able to create different grades. He later founded the Austrian company Koinur Hartmut. His grandson, Friedrich von Hartmut, refined the invention of his grandfather and created the Koinur pencils with 17 grades in 1889. In 1795, Nicolas Jacques Conté discovered a method of also using impure graphite from Germany and Austria. He pulverized the mined material and elutriated the graphite. Later he discovered the grades independently from Hartmut. Hartmut and Conté are considered the basic founders of the success of the modern pencil. Until the middle of the 19th century, this technique was widespread and caused the founding of companies like Faber-Castell, Lyra, Stettler and Schwann-Stabilo. The last chapter of this video is dedicated to all the little tools that make working with pencils and graphite a little bit easier. First of all, there are erasers. They come in many shapes, sizes, colors and hardnesses. There are, for example, kneadable erasers, which are great for lifting of graphite if an area has gotten too dark. You can knead them into any shape you require. They're great for lightening up areas in hair, clothes, highlights on skin and much more. Then there's your usual white eraser. Not to be confused with the blue-red ones you know from school. I strongly recommend to not use them because they smear like hell. Also, white erasers are not all the same. There's the ones with the shiny surfaces. I think their name is PVC erasers. 
also hands off these because they also smear and ruin your work. Only use the ones with a matte finish, like for example the Pelican WS30 that I use since ages now. Or I also heard the Tombow ones are good. These do not leave smears. There's also so called eraser pencils. They're basically like a pencil, just with an eraser as lead. They come in pink and white. I prefer the white ones though, because again, the pink one is just smearing for me. And I can only ever speak from my own experience here. Eraser pencils are an awesome tool for smaller things like hair highlights, strands, all sorts of lines and yeah, whatnot. <laughs> Be careful with these though, because depending on the paper you use, you can get erasing marks or even the paper surface coming apart. And you can also buy erasers that behave like mechanical pencils, with a button to press and a lead to insert. The Tombow Mono Zero is an example for this type of erasers. You can get these with round or rectangle shaped leads and I wouldn't want to miss them anymore in my arsenal. They're for the very finest of details. Another variation is the electric eraser. These are battery powered, also again with leads to insert into a metal or plastic clamp which come in small or big diameter and that will get rid of pencil lines you won't be able to erase with the types from before. I really love this tool. And now I'm continuing with all the tools you need for blending. There are blending stumps. These are also called blending stick, tortillon or estompen. And are made of tightly rolled paper. They have sharpened tips, come in many sizes, look like a pencil and are made to smudge things. Some artists even make their own. These are great for smudging smaller areas, not so much bigger ones though, because you tend to get ugly smears and lines when you try to do that. For bigger areas, I recommend a tissue. I personally like to sharpen or clean my blending stumps either with a coarse grain nail file or with my X-Acto knife. Next tool are, yeah, you guessed the tissues <laughs> or handkerchiefs only ever use the paper ones. They're kind of self-explaining and very useful, like said, for smudging larger areas. Be careful to work in layers though and don't flatten the tooth of your paper by pressing too hard with your pencil in the beginning. Rather apply a soft layer of graphite, smudge with the tissue and repeat until you're satisfied with your saturation. I mostly use this tool for laying down skin tones. Next two are Q-tips, also something that everyone has at home. A plastic, paper or wooden stick with a tip made of cotton. Cotton swabs are also an option for people like me whose fingers are too clumsy to work with the short little normal Q-tips. They're my favorite tool for shading and putting down a basic layer of graphite. And the next tool are paintbrushes. Yeah, you heard right. With softer ones, you can apply graphite powder like you would paint, but I am talking about the ones you know from school. The ones with the hard bristles. I learned this trick from watching a video of someone at an art school who did smooth, nice pencil backgrounds by working the graphite into the paper with a cut down bristle brush. And of course I had to try this myself and ever since then I don't want to miss this tool anymore. All you need to do is get a bristle brush of your desired size and cut down the bristles to about 1 or 2 millimeters. Then you can easily rub the graphite into the paper with it and make all the graininess and white spots on the paper disappear. Just make sure though that you wash your paintbrush every now and then because otherwise it will get oversaturated with graphite eventually and not give you the desired result anymore. 
And the last tools on our list are all the tools for white highlights. I've been trying my way through these over the years. First of all, what most people use are white gel pens. They're fine if you can find one that works. <laughs> I never had one that really worked, so that wasn't an option for me. The second try was white acrylic paint. It worked fine, but was kinda hard to get into the perfect spot with a paintbrush. I don't know. My current option is a white Posca pen. Of course, acrylic paint too, but so much more precise and also very bright. I'm highly recommending this one for now. And this is it. This is everything there is to know about pencils. I hope this video was useful for you and if you have any questions left, please feel free to drop them into the comments. As always, if you liked what you saw, please give this video a thumbs up and if you want to see more in the future, please consider subscribing. Thank you very much for watching to the very end and see you all in the next one. Bye!